puss in boots. Long ago, there died a miller whose whole property was a mill, an ass, and a cat. All this had to be divided between his three sons, and it was quickly done without the help of either lawyer or clerk. The eldest took the mill, the second took the ass, and the youngest had nothing but the cat. He indeed was greatly cast down at his poor lot. My brothers, said he, will be able to earn their living honestly by working together. But as for me, when I have eaten my cat and made a muff of his skin, I shall have to die of hunger. The cat, who heard this, but made believe that he did not, said to his master, Don't be downhearted, master. All you have to do is give me a bag and have a pair of boots made for me. Because of the brambles which scratch my legs, and then you will see that your share is not such a poor one as you think. Although his master put no great faith in this, yet he had seen his cat do so many cunning tricks to catch rats and mice, when he hung himself up by his feet and lay like dead in the flower, that he did not despair of getting help in his difficulty. When the cat had all that he wanted, he booted himself bravely and hung the bag about his neck, then, holding the strings in his two front paws, he set off for a rabbit warren, where he lived great numbers of rabbits. He put some bran and some sow thistles into his bag and stretched himself out as though he were dead, waiting until some young rabbit should be innocent and confiding enough to put his nose into the bag and eat its contents. Hardly had the lay down when all fell out as he wished. A giddy young rabbit skipped into his bag, and our friend the cat, when he pulled the strings, took him and killed him without pity. In high delight with his booty, he went off to the king's palace and asked to see him. He was shown up to his majesty's chamber. And when he had entered, he made a deep bow and said, Here, sire, is a rabbit that my lord, the Marquis of Carabao, for this was the name he had invented for his master, has desired me to present you. Tell your master, said the king, that I thank him for his gift. Another day the cat went and hid himself in a wheat field with his bag gaping open, and when two partridges had walked in, he pulled the strings and caught them both. Then he went and presented them to the king, just as he had done with the rabbit. The king again graciously received the two partridges, and bade his servants offer food and drink to the cat. For two or three months, the cat went on carrying game for his master to the king. Then, one day, when he knew that the king was to take the air along the riverside with his daughter, who was the most beautiful princess in the world, he said to his master, If you will but 
do as I bid you. Your fortune is made. You have only to go and bathe in the river at the spot which I will show you, and leave the rest to me. The Marquis of Caraba did all that his cat advised, without knowing why or wherefore. So it fell out that while he was bathing, the king passed by, and the cat began to cry out as loud as he could, Help! Help! My lord Marquis of Caraba is drowning! At this noise, the king put his head out of the coach, and seeing it was the cat which had so often brought him game, he ordered his guards to run immediately to the help of his lordship, the Marquis of Caraba. While they were pulling the poor Marquis out of the river, the cat came up to the coach and told the king that, while his master was bathing, there came by some rogues who had gone off with his clothes, though he had cried, Stop! Thief! At the top of his voice, the rogues had hidden them under a great stone. The king at once ordered the officers of his wardrobe to run and fetch one of his best suits for the Lord Marquis of Caraba. The king paid him a thousand compliments, and as the fine clothes they had brought him set off his good air, for he was a comely lad. The king's daughter fell in love with him on the spot, and the king would have him come to his coach. The cat, who was overjoyed to see his plan had begun to succeed, went on in front, and, meeting with some country people who were mowing a meadow, he said to them, Good mowers, if you do not tell the king that the meadow you mow belongs to the Marquis of Caraba, you shall be chopped as small as mince meat. Sure enough, the king asked the mowers to whom the meadow they were mowing belonged. To my lord Marquis of Caraba, answered they all together, for the cat had frightened them well. That is a fine property of yours, said the king to the Marquis of Caraba. I congratulate you. As you see, your majesty, answered he. It is a meadow that never fails to yield a plentiful harvest every year. The cat, who still went on before, met with some reapers and said to them, Good reapers! If you do not tell the king that all this corn belongs to the Marquis of Caraba, you shall be chopped as small as mincemeat. The king, who passed by a moment after, must needs to know who to whom all the corn belonged. To my lord Marquis of Caraba, answered the reapers. And the king was very well pleased. And so was the Marquis, whom he gradually congratulated. The cat went always before, saying the name, same words to all he met, and the king was astonished at the vast estates of my lord Marquis Caraba. Master Puss came at last to a stately castle, the lord of which was an ogre, the richest that had ever been known for all the country through which the king had passed was his property. The cat, who had taken good care to find out who this ogre was and what he could do, asked leave to speak to him, saying, he could not pass so near his castle without having the honor of paying his respects to him. The ogre received him as civilly as an ogre could do and bade him sit down. I have been told, said the cat, 
that you have the gift of being able to change yourself into any creature you have a mind to. You can, for example, turn yourself into a lion or elephant and the like. That is true, answered the ogre very briskly. And to convince you, you shall see me now become a lion. Puss was so sadly terrified to see a lion so near him that he immediately climbed into the gutter, not without great trouble and danger because of his boots, which were of no use at all to him in walking upon the tiles. A little while after, when Puss saw that the ogre had again taken his natural form, he came down and owned that he had been very much frightened. I have been told to, said the cat, but I can scarce believe it that you can also turn yourself into one of the smallest animals, for example, a rat or a mouse. But I must own to you, I believe this to be impossible. <laughs> impossible, cried the ogre. You shall see. And at once he changed himself into a mouse and began to run about the floor. Puss no sooner saw this than he pounced upon him and ate him up. Meanwhile, the king, who saw as he passed the spine castle of the ogres, had a mind to go into it. Puss, who heard the noise of his majesty's coach wheeling over the drawbridge, ran out and said to the king, Your majesty is welcome to this castle of the Marquis of Carabao. How, my lord Marquis, said the king. And does this castle belong to you? I have seen nothing finer than this courtyard with all the great buildings round it. Let us go in, if you please. The king went up first, the marquis following, handing the princess. They went into the great hall where they found a splendid feast the ogre had prepared for his friends who dared not enter, knowing the king was there. His majesty was delighted with the pleasant behavior of the marquis, and so was his daughter, so much so, that after having taken a glass or two of wine, he said to him, <clears throat> My lord marquis, you only will be to blame if you are not my son-in-law. The Marquis, making many low bows, accepted the honour the king offered him, and forthwith married the princess the very same day. Puss became a great lord, and never ran after mice any more, except for his own amusement. <laughs>